is a peace generation coming of age in Colombia. Six years after the FARC rebellion laid down its arms for good, one year after student-led protests against inequality and police brutality, citizens vote Sunday in the first round of a presidential election where that 2016 peace deal that ended America's uh, longest civil war is just but one factor. For the very first time in the country's history, the left could come to power. We'll ask about the many lives of candidate Gustavo Petro, a one-time rebel turned economist and mayor of Bogota. How radical a change does he and his running mate, Francia Marquez, represent? How real are the threats against them and the electoral process in a nation where militias still kill human rights activists and where there's still at least one active rebellion? More broadly, We'll see why the protests sparked by the perceived mismanagement of the COVID pandemic resonate well beyond Colombia's borders. In a Peru that faces a potential food crisis, a Venezuela still isolated on the world stage, and a Brazil which also heads to the polls later this year. Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking, will Colombia look left with us? Ricardo Abdala, Paris correspondent for a Colombian daily newspaper, El Espectador. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, from Bogota, Andres Ferrero, congressman-elect from the uh, Democratic Center Party of outgoing President uh, Ivan Duque. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for the invitation, Francois. So uh, just explain this for me very briefly. Uh, in, in the U.S., they vote for the president and the legislators the same day. Here in France, we first vote for the president, then for the legislators. Why do you vote for parliament first? Yes, uh, it's quite curious, but uh, we have these elections for the uh, House of Representatives and for the Senate first. Uh, probably they decided to divide the election in order to avoid uh, messing up things. Uh, I'm not sure why they decided to vote first for the Congress, but uh, it has been the tradition for a long, t uh, for a long time. All right, well, congratulations on your election. Uh, Sandra Borda joins us Thank as well much. from Bogota, political science professor at the uh, University of Los Andes. Welcome to the show. From London, we say hello to uh, uh, Ivan Briscoe, Latin American Caribbean program director at International Hi, Crisis for Group. The invitation. It's, it's very nice to be with you. Thank you. And uh, the France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. The hashtag is F24Debate. Uh, the only near certainty from uh, this first round is that, well, there'll be a runoff. Uh, the former mayor of Bogota, Gustavo Petro, uh, he leads according to tracking polls, followed by the former uh, mayor of uh, Medellin, who's consolidated the, the uh, conservative uh, vote, Federico Gutierrez. Uh, if we look at this graph, uh, Ricardo, we see as well, though, that there's a, um, another candidate who's sort of gaining ground here, Rodolfo Hernandez, a, a, a veteran of, of Colombian politics. Yeah, I mean, he's new in politics. He was the mayor of Bucaramanga, is the fifth city of Colombia. And he didn't show presidential ambitions until not so long ago. And then he started to rise, maybe because people think that Federico Gutierrez is too extreme on the left, on the right, sorry. And the fact that uh, former president Alvaro Uribe has supported Federico Gutierrez makes him something unacceptable for some people from some democratic Democrat people from the right. So maybe if even if they dislike Petro, they won't find that Federico Guterres is acceptable. And those votes are going now to Rodolfo Hernandez. So it's it's getting close. So there could be an upset in the first round. It could round. be an upset. For, but for we are very close. We don't know if he will pass over Federico Guterres in the last days just before the election. All right. That 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 concept of appearing moderate is one of those themes that we'll be talking about uh, in this discussion. First, though, in this election, there's the long shadow of last year's protests, which officially uh, resulted in 26 killed and uh, strong defiance of the government uh, and of police, with the spark being protests that originated in Cali against proposed uh, tax hikes that ta took place in the middle of uh, uh, COVID uh, restrictions. Uh, Yvonne Briscoe, is this the issue, inequality, heading into this election? 
It was certainly the issue underlying those protests, which came at an extremely difficult moment for, for Colombia, for the Colombians at the height of the, the pandemic, uh, with people's incomes, you know, really badly hit. And with the pandemic uh, making clear to everybody just what inequality meant in Colombian society, I think everybody knows Colombia has been extremely unequal for a long time. It's the second most unequal country in South America after Brazil. It's got very low rates of social mobility. You know, politics seems to always be in the same hands of the same people, as does business. Um, and this is a reality people have lived with. But I think during the pandemic, it, it came home very clearly. Who are the people who are going to hospital? Who are the people who are losing their incomes? They were generally the poorer people. And the richer, although they were obviously affected, um, got away with it a little bit more. And then early on, obviously, in last year, they were flying out of the country to get their vaccinations. And I think this had a, you know, a very strong impact on people. So when this tax reform did come through, proposed by the government, widening the tax base, increasing tax revenues, it was seen as just the, you know, the, the final act of, of injustice at that moment. And, and people were furious. So I think now there's a slightly different series of issues, a more complex series of issues. Um, but inequality and, and the rage against inequality uh, has been shared amongst a lot of people. They've been mobilized by those protests. And I think Petro, to a large extent, seems to have captured that energy uh, for his campaign. Yeah, the third run for president by uh, Gustavo Petro, uh, who in a previous life was a rebel with the uh, M-19, uh, the left-wing economist calling out inequality. But again, and this harks back to what Ricardo was saying a moment ago, uh, tr trying to appear moderate in a televised debate, rejecting the label of revolutionary in the mold of uh, neighboring leaders in uh, Venezuela. Chavez and Maduro made Venezuela dependent on oil. What am I proposing? That Colombia should depend on oil? I propose that Colombia depend on agriculture, industry and tourism based on a learned society. It is completely and radically different. Those who made Colombia dependent on oil and who want to maintain Colombia's dependence on oil are precisely my political rivals, some in the government and others in the campaign. They do resemble Chávez and Maduro. Okay, so uh, there you have it, Sandro Borda, um, Gustavo Petro uh, campaigning as the un-Chávez or the un-Maduro. Uh, your, your reaction to that? One of the most notable things during this campaign election is basically that the center, the political center, couldn't make it to the three or the four main candidates. So at this point of the story, I think that Petro is trying to move to the center, trying to gather some of the people who fear that a leftist government is going to be a simulation of the Venezuelan experiment. Uh, so, so this is the first time that he actually uh, has a declaration against the Venezuelan government. Four years ago, he didn't say strong things against Venezuela. And I think that this is because he knows that he has a political center that might be decisive for him in the second round. So it's, it's going to be about winning the center. And by the way, it's not just on the left they're trying to do that. Uh, you heard uh, uh, at the outset of the conversation Ricardo Abdullah mentioning uh, the shadow of Alvaro Uribe, the former president, firebrand. And while Petro's trying to distance himself from the far left, conservative candidate uh, Federico Gutierrez, FICO as he's known, also taking a step away. Uh, but this from the right. Whilst other campaigns focused on hate speech, I focused on proposals. I want to ask our followers, do not fall for provocations. While others attack us, we'll hug them. While they insult us, we'll give more proposals for Colombia. Let's not lose focus. We are going to win, but the most important thing is not winning, but transforming Colombia. Uh, Andres Ferreira, when you were on the campaign trail, did you get that sense that uh, people wanted moderates? Ponsa, we are living in a difficult times in Colombia, naturally, perhaps in all the world. Uh, the, the pandemic uh, has 
stressed the situation that we lived uh, before the pandemic, uh, that we lived before. And naturally, uh, there is a willing of changing some things and things that should be uh, improved in Colombia. Uh, I think that the center, and I agree with Sandra Borda, uh, couldn't be able to articulate a narrative in order to present a, a viable candidate to these elections. But uh, at the same time, I think that Gustavo Petro is trying to moderate his um, his proposals, but at the same time, sometimes when he is, particularly in the public space, when he is giving addresses in the public space, we see that, that those are efforts that uh, seems a bit artificial, uh, that he, we don't have to forget that he was very close to Hugo Chavez, he admired Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, and that he, in, in, in a way, is proposing the same the same uh, recipes that led Venezuela to chaos and poverty. Has Colombia changed and is Petro changing along with it? I'm not sure completely because I, I repeat the proposals that uh, Colombia has changed naturally and that is something that uh, should be assumed by all the political parties but I'm not sure that if Petro has changed so that he really has changed he is trying to estatize completely the health system in Colombia he is trying to estatize uh, the uh, the the, the, the pensional system in Colombia, and he, uh, when we hear him in the uh, in the debates, he's trying permanently to say that the state will be the uh, guarantee of all the rights for the Colombian, that the state practically will be the solution for all our problems. And I, I, I repeat, that has been proven a failure in other countries, not just Venezuela, but for example in Argentina, that have uh, printed money uh, in very great uh, amounts and that has today a very high uh, inflation rate, 60%. Here in Colombia we have a problem, we have 10% of inflation approximately, but uh, what I feel is that Petro, yes, he is uh, probably capitalizing uh, this conformity of the society, but what I see is that the proposals, that the solutions that he is offering will increase the problems and will not solution it. Ivan Briscoe, your thoughts on Gustavo Petro? I mean, I, I agree with the, the observation that in some ways he's moving towards the center, particularly when he's in a debate. But I think when we see him on the public squares, he is promising a radical transformation of the country. And he doesn't, you know, he doesn't try to hide it. He presents himself as a fundamental agent of historical change. Um, he's, he's charismatic. Um, he's to a degree messianic as well. He's certainly a populist. Um, but I think when we look at the program, program of government, 50-page historical pact, as this party coalition is known, its program of government. That's where it starts to be difficult to disentangle what might happen from what might not happen. He does have some measures he'd like to introduce immediately. No new oil exploration contracts, for example, protective tariffs around certain agricultural production um, in, in, in Colombia. But the other uh, aspects of his program universal and free health care, uh, 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 state pensions, uh, fundamentally ending the war on drugs, uh, achieving a universal basic income for Colombians. These are very ambitious uh, proposals, and it's not clear whether he would be able to achieve them in what would be one term of government, according to the Constitution, four years as a president, or whether he envisaged this as a longer series of changes over time, which is perfectly reasonable, because really what he proposes isn't that far different from a typical European welfare state mm -hmm. in many ways. Of course, the problem is, if he believes he's in a rush, and he believes he has lots of opposition against him, and he believes that he is a historical agent of change, would he try to push things along much more quick, quickly and in, in, in an authoritarian fashion, a bit like uh, 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 happened in Venezuela? Mm. Ricardo Abdullah. Well, uh, I think we're missing one point here is that uh, Petro is not only him. I mean, he has learned, but he also he has been joined by a lot of people coming from the grassroots movement, movements and he has learned 
Of course, he has changed. I guess, you know, all the left leaders in Latin America learn what went wrong in Venezuela. And he doesn't want to repeat. It's not on his interest. So all the time he's been, or Colombians are being told that if we vote for the left, we will become Venezuela. And it's clear it's not going to happen. Venezuela was a particular experience in Latin America. But things went better in Ecuador or in Bolivia or in Argentina at a certain period of time. So I think we're missing the point in saying that Petro is alone, because actually he built a coalition, he brought a bunch of new people, and the other candidates did not do that. And maybe we're missing another point is, you know, we, we say center, we speak about center, but it's the, what, what is being called center in Colombia is more like a liberal right. So it's, they are liberal on the economics, and that's why they failed in the election. That's why their candidate did so bad, because people don't feel that now it's time. But there, but there have been other coalitions, right? I mean, FICO brought together uh, uh, Andres Ferrero's party and, and, and yeah, his own. Yeah, but most of them are conservatives. Right. I, and I, I think, you know, one, one thing about uh, the, the two rights, we have two rights in Colombia. So we have the liberal right, who represents more like a bourgeoisie, historical bourgeoisie, and we had the, the new right, the landowners who are linked to paramilitars, to paramilitary forces, and those are represented by Federico Gutierrez and by his party. So we have those two rights, the liberals and the new, uh, the new rich, the landowners. And Petro built something different, and he's bringing people from the center, from the green parties, from the environmental activist group. So. Uh, spe speaking of which, if Petro's running mate gets elected, that too would break the mold. Uh, environmental activist Francia Marquez uh, would break barriers by becoming the first black woman elected to high office in Colombia, the daughter of miners. Uh, she campaigned to stop illegal gold mining in her home region near the Pacific coast. There and since, she's had to face threats from paramilitary groups. They have sown fear in us. Fear with the massacres in the territories of this country. Yeah, those security fears, no joke. At rallies, Petro and Marquez have campaigned behind bulletproof uh, shields. So uh, it's still a violent place, Colombia, and it, for, for its politics. Uh, Sandro Borda, uh, how much does a vice presidential election matter in Colombia? Well, it matters a lot during the election. We are not very clear about, you know, the functions and the tasks that the vice president is supposed to, uh, to, to perform. But what we know is that every single time the, the formula that a, that a presidential candidate, uh, you know, decides to construct is fundamental to pass to the second round. It is very interesting because what they always try to do is just basically to bring a different political force uh, through the figure of the vice president. So if they are in the left or they are in the right, they try to bring a moderate to win the sectors that are not pay, are not part of the base. But in this particular case, when we had the primaries, Francia Marquez had a wonderful turnout. And this is the reason why uh, Petro had no choice but bringing uh, Francia Marquez as a vice presidential formula. It, it's a very interesting uh, sort of work division that they have, because in, on one hand, Petro is moving to the center. He's trying to come, up, uh, to come up with a more moderate sort of speech and discourse, political discourse. And she basically has the luxury of not trying to filter and not trying to please the center or the moderate electorate. She's the, the more radical version of the coalition that Petro is representing. And are they in lockstep or are they very different politically? I think that she's a very new political figure. She She's a, basically a social activist. She comes from the communities. On the other hand, Petro is a little bit, this time around, is a little bit closer to the political class. One thing that we cannot miss in this discussion is that four years ago, when Petro was a presidential candidate, he was working only with his base. It was a pure leftist organization. Right now, he's surrounded, surrounded by many members of the traditional political class. And this is one of the reasons why Rodolfo Fernandez 
is competing in stronger ter terms with him because Rodolfo Hernandez is rebelling an against the political class. Petro is a little bit more ambivalent about the political class, and I think that that's something that is going to play a decisive role in the next election. So uh, you, you hear that, uh, 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 Andres Ferrero, that uh, 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 Hernandez uh, is seen as less of the establishment candidate than Petro is. You agree with that? Yes, I think that that's what uh, Hernandez is trying to to represent. He's trying to represent that he is not with any party, that he is not making any kind of coalitions, and probably he is. Uh, captating that kind of vote, the vote of the people which is this uh, that has this conformity with, uh, with the politicians in general. And non not the, ma the matter is not if they are right, uh, in, in the, 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 the right politicians, left politicians, center politicians. They are tired of politics. And probably, uh, I agree in, again with Sandra Borda, uh, Hernandez is uh, absorbing that vote. Uh, we had had, uh, Pedro has had very complicated scandals during the last weeks. The last one was yesterday, where a senator-elect of his party, of his movement, uh, was caught in Honduras with 62,000 $68,000 uh, in cash, not declared, and uh, it's a senator elect of, of, of his party. Uh, and he has a lot of uh, scandals, and probably Hernandez is capturing a part of that vote that is discomfort, uh, but is not uh, willing to vote uh, for Petro after those scandals. All right, so there's uh, politicians with a track record and, and, and those uh, without. Uh, we talked about the fact that uh, there are there's a new generation that's taking part in this vote, the ones that took part in those uh, student-led uh, protests a year ago. Uh, times changing in Colombia. Uh, for instance, its greatest ambassador to the world will be here in Paris this weekend. Winger Luis Diaz lines up for Liverpool in the Champions League final. These are images uh, where there's plenty of pride. His hometown of Barrancas, where almost half the population in the north is from the uh, Wayu indigenous community, an indigenous population that's, by the way, growing increasingly vocal as France 24's Jeannie Godula discovered in Bogota for a special edition of Inside the Americas. In this presidential election, young people across Colombia are stepping up, whether that's behind a podium or a microphone. Gonzalo and Walter Caragama are two brothers who did not get the chance to study in the capital. Instead, they created the rap group Embarawara, indigenous children, using their own stories as inspiration for their art. The brothers are some of the hundreds of refugees from Colombia's poorest region of Choco. They camped out for months in Bogota's national park. We were forced out of our native region by violence. The armed groups wouldn't let us go to work. We couldn't even go out to look for food. The camp in the heart of the capital was a protest, a way to demand housing and jobs while waiting for government aid. During our time in Colombia, they got it, at least in part. Hundreds of Embera were moved out of the mud into this city building. Hola. Hola. The conditions here are still very difficult. Uh, many other people from your region have chosen to go back to their region, to Choco. If you could go back, would you choose to do so? It's calmer here in Bogota. We don't hear the sound of shooting and bullets. We'll go back once we have assurances it's safe, that our homes are no longer occupied. Then we'll go back. Until then, we fight. We protest like warriors, because the government is corrupt. They say, you are indigenous people, you are victims of the violence, we are going to help, and then they do nothing. Colombia is in the midst of a presidential campaign. Do you feel like indigenous people are being represented by the candidates? The current government never wants to give us a thing. I think that the next government will take us into account and recognize us more. They won't leave us off to the side. 
Your weapon is now your music. And what message do you hope to get across? I hope that our music will be heard in other countries so they can learn about our culture and recognize it. We are indigenous people. Our culture is unique. And that report in full on Inside uh, the, the Americas. Uh, uh, there's a line in there I'm struck by, Ivan Brisco, is when uh, one of the two brothers says, uh, it's calm here in Bogota. Your thoughts? Well, compared to Choco, it would be calm. Choco is on the Pacific coast, a uh, large indigenous community, large Afro-Colombian community, and it suffered terribly from this increase in armed group activity, which we've seen in the last few years. I mean, I think a lot of people in Colombia assumed, diplomats assumed that with the peace agreement with the FARC guerrilla in 2016, you were going to see a gradual improvement across the whole of Colombia in security. And there was for a couple of years. But since about 2018, we've seen other armed groups, uh, other guerrillas, uh, dissidents of the FARC who didn't want to sign the peace agreement, uh, post-paramilitary groups, one of them, the, the, the Gulf Clan, which we've seen carry out a huge armed operation across the north of the country just a few weeks ago. We've seen them, you know, gaining ground, controlling new criminal economies, terrorizing communities, and that's what they've done in Choco. There was a whole tide of forced displacement and forced confinement uh, last year in, in, in that region, and, and it's not alone. So you understand it. Bogota is also quite a dangerous city if, if one doesn't want, mind one step. But in terms of the risk of being caught in crossfire or being forced to stay at one's home and not being able to go to the shops, I think Choco is, is rather more dangerous than Bogota at the moment. And there are other regions of the country like that as well, particularly on the border with Venezuela. And a crisis group, what, what do you advocate when it comes to taking on a problem that's lasted for, what, more than half a century? Well, you know, I think, uh, I mean, obviously the peace agreement's got a lot uh, of extremely interesting and valuable elements to it, which need, you know, need to be applied over time. It's not something which is going to be resolved in six years. But I think also one of the real problems the Duque administration has had and why it ends its term with such high levels of unpopular unpopularity is that it came to power promising, above all, one thing, security, that it would stop the violence of these other armed groups, it would bring total peace to the, to the land, and it's not achieved that, although it did exactly what it was supposed to do, which is send out the military, eradicate COCA, take a tough hand on all these measures, and it hasn't worked. So there needs to be a really serious rethink, I think, at the level of the armed forces and the new government as to how to operate in rural areas where, where people are very poor and often criminal economies are the only way they can survive and armed groups control them. They keep an eye over them and they control them. Uh, and, and so it, it doesn't work when the armed forces go in to these areas, decapitate an armed group, um, get rid of its leader, kill or capture its leader, because these armed groups continue to exist. They still control the illicit economies and they still have these, this allegiance, uh, even if it's, you know, a forced allegiance from, from communities. And to unpack, to get, as we always say in Colombia, to get the state the state to be present in the whole country across the territory remains a huge challenge. And I think that's, that's something which can't be done by the sort of forceful military measures which have been taken over the last few years and certainly not by mass eradication of coca because that just alienates and estranges communities from the state. Sandra Borda, again, the, 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 the two brothers we saw in that report, uh, they came to the capital. How many of their the people they know back home are going to vote in the election? And how much political clout do indigenous communities have now? I think that this is going to be a very particular election to the extent that uh, ethnic communities, indigenous communities, Afro-Colombian communities are going to feel more represented in this electoral contest. In the past, they didn't have a candidate. They, they weren't even part of the formula. This time around, they have Francia Marquez. Uh, and, and she has embodied the, the, the sort of approach that these communities have been waiting for years and years in Colombia. Our elites, our political elites, are basically 
white elites. Uh, in, in, in Francia Marquez, Francia Marquez has come up with a very interesting sort of approach. She has said she embodies the gender approach, the ethnic approach, and what she calls the nobodies, los nadies. She represents all these people in Colombia who has been alienated from the political system for years and years, and now they have a chance to be represented at the highest level in the state uh, through her figure. Andres Ferrero, you, you heard Ivan Brisco say that uh, a, a militarized approach to bringing peace to uh, Colombia will only get you so far. How do you bring the state to remote areas? Yes, naturally, uh, the force is not the sol is not alone the solution. Uh, they have said that in the past, that when we signed the peace agreement with the, with the FARC guerrilla, practically we were going to live in a, in a peaceful country. And the, uh, the last four years, the last six years, has proven that that was an utopy. That, was not, that is not what happened, because uh, the FARC was just one of the numerous uh, armed groups that uh, principally have the fuel uh, uh, coming from the drug uh, business. That is, I, I, I think, one of the most problematic issues that has Colombia in this moment and that the next president will have to address. Because uh, Gustavo Petro is practically saying that if he is elected uh, and when he arrives to the uh, uh, Nariño Palace, he is going to uh, make a great peace agree uh, 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 agreement with the other uh, armed groups. But uh, what we have seen is that there are groups that are not political, that they are just in the business, that they don't care about the political issues, and probably the violence will remain. Uh, the thing is that during the peace conversations, the advancement that the government, that the past governments, including the two governments of Uribe and the first government of President Santos, did in the fight against drugs were uh, overrun. They uh, marked a, a, a point of inflection, and oh, we uh, had, again, uh, increasing uh, fields, increasing numbers of hectares of uh, coca, for example. And I think that that is, that drug business is the principal issue, and that uh, that is what the next president uh, should uh, address, should face. Ricardo Abdallah? Well, I think Mr. Ferrero forgets to say that it's not that the peace agreement did not work, it's that they were not implemented that they were betrayed by the party he represents. So it's important to say that when we had the peace agreements, things started to go well. There was hope in Colombia. And then when Mr. No. Duque came to the power, he broke the agreement and social leaders were started to get killed. So, of course, you know, no, the peace was there, uh, but his party broke the agreements and betrayed the former fighters. So it's not, uh, I don't think that, you know, if we try the same approach that Uribe had, Uribe promised that he will finish with the violence, he didn't. And then Santos, and he didn't, and then Duques uh, uh, promised the same thing. So we've been 20 years but saying that if we don't fight, if we don't use the violence to stop the violence, well, the spiral will grow, but it never worked. And I think that's what people don't believe anymore. That's why they are now more inclined to refuse to continue this approach and try something new. It can work, maybe it's not going to work, but people want to try something different. And just Ferrero? But Ricardo, no, but Ricardo, first of all, you said that uh, Uribe used the force and it's, right, and it's true, and you can see the death rate in Colombia in 2002 and 2010. It was reduced in, 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 from 30,000 homicides on a year to 70,000. It was reduced in a very high uh, figure. Uh, during the peace agreements, and you, you know it perfectly, they said that we will live in a 
paradise, uh, practically, and that is not what happened. Because this they were not implemented. Because they were not implemented. No, were they, they were. Impl no, they they were implemented. They were implemented. How many social and, leaders and have been no, killed and, and, under uh, the government of Mr. No, Duque? And that's the point. Uh, uh, no, and, 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 and Ricardo, and Ricardo, and Ricardo, you said, you said, for example, that when the peace agreements were signed, uh, violence disappeared, and it's not true. There I were didn't say disappeared. There were parts in Colombia. I they, didn't they, say they disappeared. They, they, they were, it was they, reduced they, they, they when they were, were implemented, they, 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 but then they, they were betrayed they, by they, the party no, you they, represent. They, they, no, they were not. They, they are not. They were not betrayed. They were. How would they be betrayed? They were. Don't that we have? Don't we one, have? One ten, of the main don't, don't we have ten congress? Don't we have ten yeah, congressmen of the guerrilla? One of the in main the congress? points. One of the main don't points have? of Duque's campaign was not to respect the agreements. That's his point. And one of the points no, of he, uh, Federico was, Guterres' campaign it was is legit. not to respect the agreement, to change the agreement. So you cannot that say that... That is not true. That is not true, it Ricardo. Is. Federico, Federico Guterres voted yes to the peace agreement. Yeah, you he voted yes then, at the time. Yes. Let, let me bring in so, uh, so Ivan. What? Let me bring so in Ivan he, he on this. Yes, he, he, no. One, one, one last thing, uh, Francois. Sure. Federico Guterres, for example, voted yes. Uh, he uh, and I agree with uh, with Sandra. He decided a uh, uh, pres vice presidential vice presidential formula that is on the center of the political specter. Uh, he was a major of the. Green Party of a, a city called Neiva in Colombia, and he is trying to uh, open his candidature, uh, his candidatura to other uh, political forces. But he voted yes, and he is saying that he will implement the peace agreements. That yeah, because they will, have not uh, been implemented. Right, let, me, let me bring in Ivan Brisco no, on this. they have been implemented partly. They have been implemented partly, Ricardo. You can say you can say so. Uh, I, the, I, Ivan Brisco, the, I want to bring. I want to. I want to come back to something Andres Ferrero said, which is that at the the heart of this, you still have the coca trade, you still have uh, the drug trade, and that you have to stamp it out. Your thoughts on that? Well, there is obviously massive uh, coca production. It's actually, you know, in recent years reached its historic highs, a lot of cocaine being processed. But it's not so clear to me that all of the violence in Colombia is linked solely to coca. We are seeing a lot of other criminal economies, a lot of the violence along the border between Venezuela and Colombia, for example, has been connected with other forms of trafficking, with control of border crossings, with extortion, um, with illegal mining in other parts of the country. I think you're seeing a, a much more multi-crime uh, style of, of armed violence in, in, in Colombia for a start. Uh, and I think, secondly, if Coca is certainly in certain places related to powerful armed groups and violence. That doesn't mean that eradicating it is going to make everything more peaceful. Coca is there for a reason. It is, it is fundamentally a, a source of stable income because it's uh, regularly harvested over the year. It's a very hardy, very resilient plant, grows pretty much wherever you, you plant it. And that means it serves a purpose for uh, smallhold farmers, campesinas who otherwise wouldn't have any source of income. So uh, simply eradicating it simply uh, forces them into the arms of armed groups, gives them, in their view, no alternative but to cooperate with armed groups, and, uh, and makes them distrust all interaction with the state, with uh, prosecutors, with police, with the armed forces. It's no basis for actually really guaranteeing stable state presence. So what's the, the alternative? Well, the alternative, obviously, firstly, what was laid out in great depth in the peace accord, which was the voluntary substitution of coca crops, which was advancing very well, but was one of the pieces of the peace agreement which Duque government did not like and, and failed to apply in its entirety. But it's also a question of trying to get the military to uh, rebuild those sorts of relations with communities. Uh, in, and that will come in part by changing the way they uh, undertake operations, the targets of those operations, the metrics they're using. There's going to be, to a degree, a cultural change in the way the armed forces approach security in rural areas. And a lot of people in the armed forces, a lot of very senior figures, would actually agree with it. The time has come to actually start reconsidering what they're doing, because current strategy isn't working. It generates crises like those in Choco, 
Arauca, Norte de Santander. I could reel off any number of other places in Colombia where there are just these tightly wound pockets of extreme violence and social leaders are killed and communities are confined or displaced and young people are recruited and don't go to school. And it's a series of tragedies which Colombia has really got to get to grips with in the next few years. Sandra Borda, in the name of the so-called war on drugs, Colombia has had a strong ally in Washington over decades with huge amounts of support. That support mm. reinforced uh, when relations uh, went from bad to worse with neighboring Venezuela. Will all that change if Gustavo Pedro is elected president? Um, that's a very interesting question, but let me just say one thing about the previous discussion that we witnessed be between Ricardo and Andres. Uh, that's the discussion that we that was decisive last election. People are not talking about the implementation or the continuation of the peace agreement right now. This is not part of the electoral agenda. People are talking about security, a broader problem, not only related to the to the conflict. They are talking about inequality. They are talking about poverty, access to education, employment. This is not the discussion that we're witnessing right now. And this is one of the reasons why the right decided that it's not that it's not gonna get any electoral benefit from talking about the peace process again. And this is the reason why they agree with the peace process this time around, because it's not it's not going to bring any sort of electoral benefit for them right now. Um, in, in, in terms of the relationship with the United States, I think that it is very interesting what, we, what Petro and his campaign are saying about this topic, because it seems to me that they are trying to propose a sort of a continuation of the terms of reference that, that we have defined for decades and decades in our relationship with the United States. Um, they have been saying that they also want uh, to, to help construct a sort of regional integration. Uh, and that will be a, a very important uh, topic if we have the election in Brazil, uh, it, you know, bringing Lula back to the stage, because he's a very important figure when, it, when we talk about integration, regional integration. So, so they want to look at the United States. They want to maintain the relationship with the United States. And does They've the U.S. feel the same way? Formulating uh, the trade agreement. But, but I think that it's, it's not going to happen pretty soon. Sorry, Francois, you said? Does the U.S. feel the same way as Gustavo Petro does? Are they ready to reciprocate? I think that the, the, I think that the one and only fear that the United States has right now is related to to Russia's and China's approach mm -hmm. to the region. Mm -hmm. These two countries have not been playing a crucial role in Latin America, and they are getting closer and closer, and they've been playing a crucial role in the resolution of the Venezuelan crisis. So uh, Washington was basically not looking very carefully to this phenomenon, but right now they are very concerned. They organized this summit of the Americas that is going to happen in two weeks. Uh, they they want to bring Venezuela the Venezuelan government back to the negotiation table again. So I, I, I think that they want a government that they can, they can count on uh, still and, and not a government that is going to look in, in maybe too friendly terms to China and Russia. Ricardo Abdallah, we're out of time. But yeah, with uh, uh, the relationship between Washington and Caracas is changing relationship uh, with Washington and Colombia and Brazil? Is it going to change? Is it going to be any different? If I, I the left think, comes to I power think that's countries? not their main concern now, as, as Sandra said. You know, I think they can be a, can have a good relation with Petro. Petro is not the as radical as he's painted, and he has changed over the year, and he will govern. I mean, if he makes it, he makes it to the presidency. He'll have a coalition. So I think they will be in good terms. I think it's in the interest of, in the interest of everyone. And they'll have a Congress to contend with. Andres Ferreira will be there. Uh, I want to thank you, Andres, for being uh, with us from Bogota. I want to thank Sandra Borda as well uh, for joining us from the Colombian capital. Thank you very capital. much, Francois. Uh, Ricard, uh, Ricardo Abdullah, thank as you. well as uh, Ivan Briscoe in London. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.